Welcome to the Barbecue Roundup, a weekly program that supplements the Barbecue Central show, which can be heard live each Tuesday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at thebbqcentralshow.com. I'm Greg Rempe, and this is Episode 2 of the Barbecue Roundup for March 3rd, 2016. Coming up in a few minutes. I'm not going to be one of these barbecue guys that's going to act like I'm real secretive because I can give you the product and I can give you the recipe and you still have to go cook it. That was Heath Riles, pitmaster of Victory Lane Barbecue. We'll have more conversation with Heath and find out a lot more about his background and, more importantly, the products that he is offering to the barbecue community. We'll go over this past weekend's competition results through the various sanctioning bodies, give you a look ahead at some upcoming events, review two new barbecue sauces, and answer some listener email in the mail call segment. All this and more on this edition of the Barbecue Roundup. Let's get to this week's news. The first report coming from a website called cron.com by Sid Kearney asking the question, who says barbecue isn't fine dining? The founders of Houston Barbecue Festival are launching a dinner series that further blurs the lines between fine dining and smokehouses. The first of the Smoke on the Bayou series featuring Hubble and Hudson executive chef Austin Simmons and pitmaster Will Buckman of Corkscrew Barbecue will be March 20th at the Bistro, 24 Waterway in the Woodlands. The five-course meal will be accompanied by wine and beer pairing, selected by Hubble and Hudson sommelier Derek Ryan. Cost is all-inclusive at $195. This dinner has been almost two years in the making, said J.C. Reed, co-founder of the Houston Barbecue Festival and barbecue columnist for The Chronicle. The idea originated when I ran into Austin one Saturday morning at Corkscrew Barbecue. Chefs are pretty selective about where they eat in their off hours, so I was kind of surprised to see him there. Turns out he's a huge fan of Will's Barbecue. Expect future dinners to follow the same recipe, pairing the region's top chefs with the best barbecue pitmasters. Our next story coming out of Arlington, Virginia. The Hearth Patio and Barbecue Association, or HPBA, and Casual Living Magazine are pleased to announce Stan Hayes as this year's winner of the prestigious Donna H. Myers Barbecue Leadership Award. Stan is co-founder and CEO of Operation Barbecue Relief, a disaster relief organization that has provided hot meals in 18 states and 28 different locations and served approximately 644,938 meals. Founded after the F5 tornado that impacted Joplin, Missouri, in May 2011, Operation Barbecue Relief's expert pitmaster and volunteers deployed to disaster sites to provide comfort food, compassion, hope, and friendship to those whose lives have been torn apart. The stars of the barbecue industry include those who barbecue for the greater good, and Stan Hayes and his organization, Operation Barbecue Relief, should be an example to all of us, said Jack Goldman, president and CEO of HPBA. He has helped build an organization that has given a lot of his time to seamlessly feed victims of disasters, and we are proud to count Stan as a member of the barbecue community. While spreading Barbecue Relief's mission, Stan is also a champion pitmaster and caterer. With his team, County Line Smokers, Stan has won two grand championships, four reserve grand championships, and numerous first-place category finishes at KCBS events. Recently, Stan was a chopped champion runner-up in the Grillmaster finale on the Food Network. Stan works for Farmers Insurance as a personal lines sales zone manager. The 2016 Donna H. Myers Barbecue Leadership Award will be presented March 17th in New Orleans, Louisiana, during the Big Green Egg Cook-Off at the HPB Expo 2016. Now in its fifth year, the award sponsored by HPBA and Casual Living recognizes innovative leaders who have contributed to the growth of their companies and the overall industry. Recipients combine distinguished professional achievement and community service with problem-solving skills and an unwavering commitment to the barbecue industry. Donna H. Myers was a leading barbecue industry advocate who died in January 2011. Previous winners include Ron LaRocca, 30-year marketing and sales veteran instrumental in growing the barbecue industry, Ed Fisher, founder and chairman of Big Green Egg, and George A. Stevens, founder of Weber Stevens Products and creator of the Weber Kettle Grill. The first award in 2012 was given posthumously to Myers. Dickey's Barbecue Pit is back in the news again, this according to a report out of Dallas February 26. In an effort to increase the quality and efficiency of operations, Dickey's Barbecue Pit has adopted new cleaning products in all stores. The new product replaces a system which has been a consistent source of owner-operator feedback. Taking that feedback into consideration, Dickies has partnered with Ecolab to introduce a more effective and eco-friendly line of cleaning products system-wide. As this initiative is a complete overhaul of the existing cleaning systems, the new products include dish detergent, sanitizer, floor cleaner, heavy-duty cleaner degreaser, glass cleaner, and soap. Ecolab will visit every Dickies location for installation. In a statement, 
These new products are gold standard in the industry, says Tamala Fowler, vice president of R&D and purchasing. The test phase was overwhelmingly positive, and we were glad to offer our owner operators these high performance, cost efficient cleaning products in their stores. The new products not only come with personalized insulation, but training from an Ecolab technician, which will then be supported by product ID, application posters in every store. Ecolab QSR specializes in helping customers deliver a cleaner, safer, more efficient, and sustainable operation consistently across their chain to help improve revenue, lower operating costs, protect their brand, and drive guest experience. To find a Dickie's Barbecue Pit nearest you, check them out on Facebook, Twitter, or the Instagrams. This next story takes us down to Texas, where a group of blind barbecue fans got a unique tour of the Houston Livestock and Rodeo Cook-Off. This according to ABC13.com. A group of visually challenged Texans joined thousands of fans celebrating the art of barbecue at the local Texas Livestock Show and Rodeo. The World's Championship Barbecue kicked off this past Thursday, and about 10 blind historians got the chance to visit award-winning tents and sample their food. In a quote, I wanted to bring more hope fun, adventure, and joy into the lives of my visually impaired and disabled friends through this multi-sensory tour, said Chelsea Wynn, a small business owner who teamed up with the rodeo to host the group. There's a new web series featuring famed 17th Street Barbecue and St. Louisan Glory Mac, this according to a report from RiverfrontTimes.com. For a few hot summer days, self-proclaimed city girl Glory McCullum found herself in the small town of Murfreesboro, Illinois, for what she called a life-changing experience. The St. Louis attorney who goes by Glory Mac has been invited to participate in a web series being filmed in the world-famous 17th Street Barbecue in Murfreesboro, Illinois. It was three intense days of classes, cooking challenges, and camaraderie. But Glory Mac came out the other side ready to open her own barbecue joint in St. Louis. The new six-episode YouTube series produced by St. Louis-based Cool Fire Studios is part barbecue how-to and part storytelling, as each participant is looking to further their barbecue hopes and dreams. The web series is a first for the high-profile 17th Street Barbecue while running the popular restaurant in Murfreesboro. For three decades, Mike Mills became one of the most prolific pitmasters in the country. Through success on the competition barbecue circuit and with the popularity of 17th Street Magic Dust Rub, the brand is bigger than ever. With daughter Amy Mills, the pitmaster co-authored a book, Peace, Love, and Barbecue, and runs the on consulting arm of the business. 17th Street emphasizes the importance of barbecue culture and connecting with the local community. If people don't embrace barbecue as a culture, they're probably not going to be successful, says Amy Mills. For meat smoking techniques and side preparations to service and food truck operations, McCollum says she learned a lot during this experience. All six episodes were released Thursday, February 25th. You can barbecue and binge rather than Netflix and chill, according to Amy Mills. Fire safety first. Officers prevent tragedy after barbecue gone wrong, fire officials say. This according to a report from KIMT.com and reporter Michaela Hilgert. This out of Rochester, Minnesota, after charcoal was left in a trash bin from a barbecue on Monday. Authorities say a Rochester police officer noticed six to eight foot flames going up behind a home around 11 p.m. At the home in the 600 block of 11th Avenue Northeast, the officer used his fire extinguisher and then called three others to continue putting out the fire before crews arrived. Authorities Authorities say whoever had the barbecue put snow on the charcoal in an effort to extinguish the fire, but that wasn't enough. Fire officials say if it weren't for the officers keeping the flames at bay until the fire department arrived, the situation could have been a lot worse. These competition results are for February 25th, 2016, and we stop in the Kansas City Barbecue Society first. The Shotgun Fred Barbecue Showdown took place in Huntsville, Texas. Winning that one was Meat and Slims with a 685.1, 42 teams taking place in that one. Also in the KCBS, the Sam's Club National Barbecue Tour kicked off domestically in Daphne, Alabama. Winning that one, Kewen, Stewen, and Bruin. 30 teams there, and he won it with a 689.09. In the Florida Barbecue Association, there was one contest that took place, Ribs on the Ridge in Haines City, Florida. Winning that one, Jim Elser of Sweet Smoke Q. And finally, we swing down to Texas, where the International Barbecue Cookers Association, or IBCA, saw five cook-offs take place with four reporting. Smoking on the Rio in Mercedes, Texas. 248 teams at that one. Danny Lura in Hognito wins. Irving Elks Lodge in Irving, Texas. 51 teams there. Chris Hatcher of Chat and Chew Barbecue wins. Curo Turkey Fest, Ragon Cajun Cookoff in Curo, Texas, winning that one. Troy Cresswell can't smoke this. 
Good Bull Barbecue Cook-Off in Curtin, Texas. Winning that one, Kelly Curtis of Panther Creek Barbecue. And the third annual Smoke It Up Cookers Cook-Off in Houston, Texas. Winning that one, David Barker of Poke It and Smoke It Barbecue. The Texas Gulf Coast Association did not have any cook-offs this past weekend. The Lone Star Barbecue Society had one cook-off that was not reported. There was also an unsanctioned event, the Harley-Davidson Barbecue Shootout in Round Rock, Texas. Winning that one, Ernest Cervantes of Burnt Bean Barbecue. Oh, by the way, there was a rather large cook-off that took place in Texas as well, the Houston Livestock and Rodeo Cook-Off. I caught up with the Barbecue Central Show's official embedded correspondent in Texas and the pitmaster of Rogue Cookers, Doug Scheiding, to talk a little bit about this particular event. I asked Doug to explain the majesty of the Houston Livestock and Rodeo. It's like Tent City. Um, It's a corporate-dominated event. It's interesting because there are so many tents basically in front of the pit and and the main area because most people have bands and buffets and things like that. You actually don't get to see many of the pits. Most of the pits are behind the tent in kind of like a little alleyway. You know, there's a waiting list to get in. I've heard anywhere from five to ten years or something like that. So it's not like your average event where you pay your money and, you know, the week before, two weeks before, and uh, you you get to go cook it. So because there's so many corporations, you have to be tied in with a corporation or asked to cook on behalf of a corporation. So there's a lot of hired guns, so to speak, where they get uh, you know, different teams, competition cookers to actually cook on behalf of the uh, event and the corporate sponsor. I asked Doug from a high level perspective, whether is it a bucket list item? If you are in Houston, is it somewhere that you need to go, whether you're making plans to get there or not? Here's what he told me. The weather was fantastic this weekend. So they had, you know, it's it's typical 200,000 attendees and, you know, you can't get cell service and you can only text people and you get that sporadically. But um, uh, there were quite a few actually, you know, kind of celebrity type people that, that were there. I wasn't aware that, you know, it was so well attended, you know, because Mo Kaysan was there and, of course, Tuffy and, you know, Ronnie Killian of Killian's Barbecue and Harry Sue came uh, and, and visited with our, our tent and stuff. So I think it's uh, one of the events, kind of a bucket list. In fact, that's why Harry Sue came, because I've been talking with him and, and know him a bit. And he said that Houston was on his bucket list to attend. And, and so that's why he actually came and attended the event. And because it is different, you know, in the scoring and, you know, the individual categories against each other, like the similar to the Memphis and May that you mentioned. So it, it is a little different. The American Royal is considered, you know, a big party, et cetera. Houston is just a huge party, kind of on steroids. As I mentioned, I think last year in our interview, my wife calls it uh, barbecue gras because it's really a party first. And then, oh, yeah, by the way, then Saturday you get serious and then there's the competition. So to get into the contest a little bit more, I asked Doug about the meats that qualify you to win or potentially win the Houston Livestock and Rodeo Barbecue Cook-Off? They've got uh, the three main Texas meats, the the chicken, uh, ribs, and brisket. They have uh, an alternative um, uh, sideline category of a Dutch oven dessert, and that turn-in is on Friday. The other turn-ins are on Saturday. Most cook-offs, at least here in Texas, they tag your meat, so in the case of chicken, you have to tag a wing or tag you know two wings together. Uh, I cook my chicken spatchcock because you can't cut any of the meat categories without an ambassador in, in front of you. You know you cook it and then they see that you're cutting off of the meat that's tagged. In the case of ribs, you get two ribs and brisket, you get two briskets. And so there are two turn-ins as well. So that uh, in the case of ribs, that's a little complicated because in the the first turn in, let's say it's at 230 and you've got to turn in six bones. And then the second turn in, if you make finals and there's only 24 teams that make finals, you have to cook as if you're making the finals and then you have to turn in 10 ribs. So it's, it's a little close getting 10 ribs off of a rack of ribs. The Houston Livestock and Rodeo event is well known for having not only a lot of foot traffic, but a lot of teams. I asked Doug how many teams he thought were competing there this year. I think it ranges from about 225 to 250, and there, but there's 424 this past year. There were 424 entries. The, the difference being that if you've got a spot at the Houston Rodeo, let's say one spot, that allows you one turn in. 
You have a lot of the corporate sponsors that have, you know, spots that have the size of two tenths, four tenths or six tenths. So in the case of the champion that won this year, I believe they had four entries. Well, Doug and I were talking strategy on how to win Houston Livestock and Rodeo. I asked him, if you have ribs and you have brisket and everybody thinks that they're fabulous to eat and everybody strives to make great brisket and great ribs, does chicken even have a shot? It seemed to me that chicken was almost counterintuitive to turn in if you were going up against the legendary Texas barbecue meats. Actually, it's the contrary. That's why I cooked chicken last year because... My chicken was was doing pretty well at the time, so obviously you want to cook something that you're doing well with, but fewer people turn in chicken. So like in the case of this year, there were only 86 chicken entries, there were 194 rib entries, and there were 144 brisket entries. So it, your odds of getting in the top eight, you know, from a percentage standpoint, are much better with chicken. I know some teams that had like two spots, and they both, they turned in chicken. They turn in two chickens. So you're not prohibited to, from turning in the same meat. So they had two entries of the 86 in chicken, and that increased their odds to actually get in the top eight. The goal is to get into the top eight because they take the eight uh, top eight chickens, top eight ribs, and top eight brisket from the first turn in. So your, your best odds are with chicken. Your worst odds are with ribs. So Doug, tell me how these meats are actually judged out there. They give five points for sight you know, the appearance, they give 10 points for smell, and then they give 15 points for tenderness, and then they give 20 points for taste. So that's a total of 50 points. And so there's a judge, of, there, each table has six judges, and they what they do is each judge gives a score, you know, basically zero to 50, and then they times it times two to get to 100. But, but then they take the lowest judge score out, throw that out, and then they average those five judge scores and then that that becomes your score so you know it's it's so if you if your average was 45 then then your score would be 90. In the end Bulldog reigns supreme and takes grand championship at this year's Houston Livestock and Rodeo. I asked Doug to weigh in a little bit on those top two finishers. I'm not as familiar with Bulldog Mountain but they crushed it. They're you know they they actually made three uh, finals. They made the finals in all in all three categories and they wound up finishing first, eighth in chicken, and 15th in brisket overall. So they really crushed it. They had, so of the 24, they actually had three chances to win. Thanks again to Doug Scheiding from Rogue Cookers for giving us a little bit more insight to the Houston Livestock and Rodeo competition. That's going to do it for this past weekend's events results. Let's go ahead and look into the calendar events that are coming up this weekend. Taking a look ahead to this weekend for barbecue competitions in the KCBS, Bodegetta Barbecue in Auburn, Alabama will take place. Also, there is Sip and Swine Barbecue Festival, a Georgia Barbecue Championship Qualifier in Lawrenceville, Georgia. Fire and Ice Barbecue World Championships in Isle, Minnesota will be taking place. And finally, the Sam's Club National Barbecue Tour will make its second stop in Shreveport, Louisiana. In the Florida Barbecue Association, there is one event taking place this coming weekend, the Smoke on the Water Barbecue and Music Festival in Tomston, Florida. And in Texas, the Turn and Burn will be going down this weekend as well. Attention residents of the Batavia, New York area, the Leroy Pavilion Stafford Kiwanis Scholarship Fund is sponsoring a pulled pork barbecue from 11.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. March 12th at Pavilion High School's bus entrance. The barbecue will be prepared by the farmer's wife. It will benefit the Leroy Pavilion Stafford Kiwanis Scholarship Fund. Tickets are $9 pre-sale, $10 at the door. You can call 585-584-8795 for more information. If you're interested in taking a barbecue cooking class coming up this year, Bill Gillespie from Smokin' Hogs has a tell-all class coming up May 26th through the 27th. You can go to SmokinHogsBBQ.com for more information or to register. Jim Elser from Sweet Smoke Q is holding a class May 21st and 22nd. You can register or get more info at sweetsmoke and the letter Q.com. Travis Clark from Clark Crew Barbecue is holding a class April 29th and 30th. You can get more information at ClarkCrewBBQ.com or to register. March 12th and 13th, 
Rub Bagby of Swamp Boys is holding a Swamp Boys Q School. You can register or get more info at swampboys, B-O-I-S, swampboys.com. That's this coming weekend's calendar of events. If you have something coming up that you would like to have promoted here on this show, please drop me an email, greg at thebbqcentralshow.com. Now let's go ahead and head on over to the sauce review portion of the show. We tried two barbecue sauces this week. Since we've never done a barbecue sauce or rub review segment yet, of course, we're only one episode in. Here's some of the basic ideas on how we will actually rate sauces and rubs going forward. At the very end, we will give an overall rank between one and five. One being the absolute worst, five being absolute barbecue rapture. We will also break down the sauce or rub in segments, the nose, the viscosity, and the taste. Up first on the tasting table is Victory Lane's mild barbecue sauce. We averaged out a pleasant nose. The viscosity of this sauce is pretty thick, and you can actually see a lot of chunked ingredients in this sauce. The flavor averaged out to be pleasant, giving this sauce an overall score of 3 out of 5. Now, for me personally, this sauce had a nose which immediately hit me with liquid smoke. Of course, I am a longtime non-fan of liquid smoke, so it knocked it down a little bit for me. I could taste it. However, the sauce had good spice. I liked the chunks for a little bit of different texture in the mouthfeel, but there was some liquid smoke creeping through. All in all, not too bad. The second sauce that we tried was Victory Lane's Sweet Barbecue Sauce. On average, this one had a pleasant nose, was a little bit more on the thin side, not super thin, but not super thick, kind of medium thickness. And around the tasting table, this averaged out to a pleasant taste as well. Now, for me personally, I thought the nose on this sauce was absolutely fantastic. I rated it excellent. I did like the viscosity on this sauce more than I did on the first one. And I thought the taste was absolutely great as well. thought it had good spice, just like the first one. I could taste the brown sugar really shining through, which is good because it is a sweet barbecue sauce. And I could taste some of the garlic and other spices in there as well. For me personally... This was more four out of five than, you know, three out of five territory. Now, overall, this sauce did rank four out of five with everybody else in the tasting panel. If you're interested in trying either the mild barbecue sauce or sweet barbecue sauce from Victory Lane, you can pick it up at their website at victorylanebbq.com. I'll also have a link to these products in the show notes as well. If you've got a sauce you'd like us to review here on the Barbecue Roundup, please contact me via email greg at thebbqcentralshow.com and we will schedule your sauce to be reviewed on a future show. In the mailbag this week, I got a question from Rich Calhoun. It says, hi, I was wondering what the best charcoal smoker you would recommend, preferably under $500 been smoking about two years and want to upgrade from my basic beginner smoker and would prefer something vertical with vents? Rich, that's a great question because that is a price point that is very popular with folks that are kind of in the beginnings of barbecue. And if you're any fan of my Tuesday show, you know hands down where I'm going. Weber Smoky Mountain. Now there's two different sizes. There's an 18 and a half inch. I believe there's a 25 inch as well. I started out with the 18 and a half inch. Right now, I believe it's right around $300. The bigger one, obviously going to be a little bit more. So first, take into account where the budget is really. And then, as I always say when you're getting ready to buy a cooker, take into account that 5 to 10% of increase of people that you might be cooking for. So maybe you have a family of 5 or 6 or 3, and that's going to be who you're cooking for 90 to 95% of the time. But maybe 5 to 10% of the time, you have 35 and 40 people over for a big party at some point. You want to have a cooker that's going to be able to accommodate that if you're not going to buy multiple smaller ones. So get all that ironed out and then buy the right one. Remember, the worst thing that you can get when you buy a barbecue pit is buyer's remorse. We don't want that. Be comfortable up front with the purchase. That way you're going to prevent any buyer's remorse. The reason I like the Weber Smoky Mountain, it does have three vents at the bottom of the charcoal bowl so you can adjust temperatures onto the fire. And it also has the exhaust vent on the top dome. You have Weber's legendary customer service and warranties. And I've just had a lot of great 
firsthand experience on multiple Weber Smoky Mountains. If you do any kind of internet research, if you talk to anybody that's had one, it's absolute love fest all the time with Weber Smoky Mountains. So for you, Rich, I would absolutely recommend an 18 and a half inch or bigger. Again, that depends on your particular situation, Weber Smoky Mountain Cooker. And thanks again for writing into the show. Keith Riles of Victory Lane Barbecue has been competing for years now. However, recently he has been setting the barbecue world on fire with his sauces, rubs, and unique product, Butter Bath and Wrap for ribs and pork. Keith was gracious enough to sit down with me for this episode's In the Spotlight section, where we learn about how he got into barbecue in the first place, and he tells us a story about how he got into the whole barbecue rub, sauce, and selling business. Keith, if you could, tell us a little bit about how you got into the world of competition barbecue. About 18, 19 years ago now, when I graduated high school in 1997, my best friend, his uncle, had a little competition team and cooked and traveled a little bit and done about eight or ten contests a year. And and we kind of hung out with him, and and he was a single man at the time and got the feel of it. And I kind of said, that's something that I'd like to do, so we borrowed his smoker and stuff one time and went and cooked used his recipes and his rubs and uh, we got like i don't know about middle of the pack i guess after that he said well if you guys are going to do this you need to go out and get your own grill and own smoker and stuff like that so went to several barbecues and found what i liked and i took welding in school and went and built my own uh, smoker and grill and stuff and just kind of grew from there in the hometown i lived in i had two kcbs contests a year that i always cooked in and I cooked in those for about eight years, just those two contests every year. Kind of got my feet wet cooking at home a whole lot. Moved to Memphis area and started cooking a whole lot more. And it's just kind of snowballed from that. And now I do, on average, anywhere from 25 to 30 contests a year. And and I guess you could say that I'm a self-taught cook. The other side of your situation, aside from the competition scene, is that you have a fairly large variety of products that you sell into the barbecue and grilling community. You have the rubs, you have barbecue sauces, you have this new product that we're going to be talking about a little bit later on and more in depth. Were the products first or was the competition first and then the products kind of followed suit after that? The competition was definitely first. I started trying to create a base rub years ago and I come up with the sweet barbecue rub and the mild sauce. And kind of everything else is born off of those two products. And back two years ago, I wanted something. All I had was the all-purpose and the sweet rub. And I wanted something with more flavors. The Memphis Barbecue Network that I mainly cook in is really big on flavor. So I reached out to my co-packer and I said, hey, I said, I want to buy some flavored sugar or powder. What is it? How do you sell it? He said, what are you looking for? And I said, well, I want to order a peach, a pecan, an apple, a cherry, a maple. I said, don't you send me all these powders and stuff. I'm going to play with some rubs. And so I did that. Basically, to be honest, all I did was take two cups of the brown sugar out of my sweet rub, the brownulated sugar, and add two cups of the flavoring in. That's the only difference between the rubs, and all of them are really unique because of the different flavorings. It's not something that I went out and totally redone or anything like that. So it has the same amount of salt, pepper, paprika, everything. I just changed the flavors in it. So it was really easy to slide over that scale. And then I started testing those, and I went back and I tweaked the peach a little bit, and everything else I left alone. The other sauces, all I did was pull out some of the other flavoring and kind of start playing with stuff and learning spices. And I guess I've got a, a pretty decent palate, and it just kind of snowballed from there. From when you started competing to when you started selling the first round of products into the marketplace, what kind of a time gap was that? Probably 14, 15 years. The whole product selling thing is kind of in its infancy if you're looking at the whole view of your barbecue background right now. That's right. And actually, when I first started going to a co-packer, I was just buying product for myself to use. I just didn't want to make it anymore. I didn't even sell it to the public. Now, there were some friends that got it, but I didn't have barcoding. I didn't have anything like that. I had uh, been a part of different teams. I started other teams and stuff. And I was kind of at uh, the middle of the road of what I was going to do as far as competition. 
and I hooked up with some guys that, that had started Victory Lane Barbecue. They were just tailgating and cooking at the local college games here in town. He had a degree in marketing and business, and he wanted to build a barbecue brand. And so we kind of teamed up and have done that together, and he is uh, – we're looking at opening up a restaurant, and we're going to look at some food trucks actually uh, sometime this afternoon. And he's built another great business here in town, and we just uh, – we kind of hit it off really good when we first met each other about four years ago, and, and that's when it really, really took off. I started marketing all my products and cooking under that name and, and kind of took everything over, and uh, – it's just really exploded into what it is today. Keith, the product line currently very extensive, a lot of different choices to choose from. I wonder when you first started out, was it a little bit more reduced as far as the offerings that you had, or was your products portfolio still fairly robust at that point? No, it was really small. I had the sweet rub and I had the mild sauce is what I started with. And then I grew into the vinegar sauce and the all purpose rub about six months later. Well, after the mild and the sweet i did have the base and marinade and then i grew into the all-purpose and the the other and actually the sweet sauce was not created until 2014 right before i went to the world food championship in vegas i knew i needed uh, something to kind of push me over the edge out there something a little different and so that's when that sauce was created actually and then the flavored rub i started working on them in 2014 about april and by July, I was testing really hot and heavy and had sent some out to some teams and stuff. I had bought it in bulk and resealed it myself and got everything tweaked to like I wanted. And by October, I was going to market with it in 2014. Is it safe to say, Heath, that when you are competing, and it might sound like an odd question, right, but it's worth asking, you're using Victory Lane products while you're hitting the competition trail? Yes. Yes, I am. Are they variations yeah. of what you use? Or are you a guy that can use your Straight out of the can, right? Straight it, out of the can. I sauce. use it right out of the bottle. Wow. Um, and a lot of people, you know, are like, oh, you're probably mixing something with it. And I'm one of those guys, if you ever met me at a comp, you can come in my trailer, you can watch me. I have nothing to hide, I don't have any secrets. I really just don't care. And I think that's really what's pushed me over the edge. I've been very fortunate with competition barbecue, and I help a whole lot of people. And I give people recipes all the time and show them stuff. And I've had some classes and stuff like that, too, that I've done and hosted in Georgia and stuff, but I'm not going to be one of these barbecue guys that's going to act like I'm real secretive because I can give you the product and I can give you the recipe and you still have to go cook it. Heath, one of the things that a lot of people have gotten into, even in the backyard, and obviously the guys on the competition scene have been doing it for quite a long time, if not ever, is the wrapping of ribs. Now, over time, that might have started with just the ribs going in foil, tightly wrap them back on the pit. The evolution of flavor profile and trying to give yourself an edge has now spawned putting stuff in the foil, brown sugar, butter, tiger sauce. I mean, you name it, a veritable cornucopia of stuff is going into the wrap these days. One of the products that I wanted to talk about specifically with you during the spotlight is the butter bath wrap that you have come up with. So if you could, for the folks that don't know about it, tell us a little bit about the product itself and what spawned your creativity to say, hey, this is something that needs to see market time. Well, I'll tell you how I got started with all that kind of stuff. I used to be like everybody else. And when you wrap your ribs, you have to put something in the fall with them. And kind of the basic old school recipe is butter, brown sugar, honey, and spices, depending on what you want to use in it. I was doing like everybody else, squeeze parquet and squeeze honey and all that. And I said, there's got to be an easier way to do this. And so I grew up in the country, and my grandmother always used country crock butter. The whole problem is I preach to people about being consistent. Produce the same product week in, week out when you're on the circuit. You need to know what you've done the week before. I grew up with my grandmother cooking cornbread and eating country crock butter and stuff. So I told my wife, I said, if I take a certain amount of butter, and it turned out to be a tub of country crock butter, and I take a certain amount of brown sugar, I take a certain amount of honey, how many ounces, and I take these spices over here a certain amount, and I said, I mix them up in your KitchenAid mixer, and I'm going to beat it like cake batter. And I make that butter look like cake batter. And then I poured it all in a Ziploc bag, and then when it got time to wrap ribs, all I did was cut the end off of it, and I piped it in the foil. And I piped the line down in the foil and then line on the back of the rib and wrapped the rib up. And so I went to a contest with a friend of mine. He needed some help, and I made it up, and we had it there, and we used it. Took a 180 rib that day. I had actually left before awards, and he called me, and he said, man, got a 180 rib, done real well. 
He said, you need to think about putting that stuff in a powder form. That'd really make it easy. And so on the ride home, I got to thinking to myself, I think I can do this. I called a, my co-packer of the spice company and I said, hey, do you sell a powdered butter, a dehydrated butter? And he said, he said let me find out. And he called me back that Monday and uh, he said, yeah, we do. And I said, well, send me five pounds of it. He sent me some and of course I used brownulated sugar and granulated honey and started mixing spices and stuff. And I started coming up with a mixture that I could mix with liquid. And I played with it for about a solid six months, I guess, before I got the ratio mixture right of how I wanted to do it. And I went with a 12 ounce bag uh, because you can, I suggest mixing four cups of water or juice with it. I pour mine in a blender with four cups, blend it up, and then I pour it up in either a squirt bottle or either a like a measuring, a marinating tub to know how much I'm making of it up. And for St. Louis style ribs, I measure out one cup per slab. So I'm the same on every slab. And baby back ribs, I measure about three quarters of a cup. But my baby backs are also cut down to about 12 bones, also kind of short. And so that way, it makes you really consistent. And so it takes another variance out of you making a mistake. And I launched that product about a month ago now, and I've had record sales with it. And I've really created a buzz around the barbecue community. Uh, I get more phone calls and messages every day about it than I can hardly keep up with. Is the success of the product the fact that the American competition public is always looking for an easy way and this is something that less products to take, uh, you know, less manual labor, whatever you want to call it? Or is it just the fact that you are able to be so consistent as you said, replicate consistency time and time again for victory. Where do you think that this product is really weighing in? The laziness of America or the replication of America? Probably both. For me personally, I like to keep things clean when I'm in a trailer or on a table or whatnot. And when I raise the grill lid to wrap ribs, if you had a bag of brown sugar sitting there and you had squeeze butter and honey, you know, it just created a mess. Stuff got everywhere with you trying to keep on a glove and grab brown sugar and sprinkle it on there and then wrap it up in the foil and you never could get all of it off your hands and you're grabbing the honey bottle and you're grabbing the butter bottle and it's sliding out of your hand because you got stuff all over you. And so that was my thing with it. That's why I went to the whole mixing it up at home in a bag, doing the liquid form at first, just to make it easier and neat. I don't like a big mess at all. I like to stay neat and clean and clean as I go. You know, I think for a lot of competition guys, it's probably a little bit of both. Uh, they don't want to have to haul all that stuff. They don't want to get messy, dirty. They're lazy. They want something that's easier. You know, and if you're creating the same flavor profile for those people that probably 80% of people use when they wrap, I guess my big thing is why not? If you could cut something off of your time uh, to give you time to do something else and where you measure it out, either you squirt it out in a squirt bottle, really you know, fast, but you're still not measuring it out. And my whole thing was to get consistent by measuring it out and doing the exact amount every single time. And and so I kind of think it weighs on both of those, what you said. When the product is made after you add whatever liquid you're using, water or apple juice, as you said, what kind of a consistency is it? You had mentioned cake batter a little bit earlier in the interview and you were piping it out, uh, which to me seems like it would be more of a cake batter before it's baked and finished. A similar idea here, or is it more in the liquid form? It's more in the liquid form, but if you actually chill it and get it cold after you mix it, like um, if I stick it in my Yeti cooler, it will actually thicken up a little bit. It won't stay to a liquid consistency. It will start to thicken a little bit, kind of like a parquet that's been sitting in the sun, but it's still not a liquid form. It's kind of like that. So after you have developed it, you get it to market, you have it available for sales, you said it's been going very well sales-wise. Did you anticipate it was going to go this well, and is there any potential supply shortage that people would need to concern themselves with? I did not anticipate for it to go as well as it's been going. I mean, I've kind of built a nice little online business, and this year, I didn't really push it that hard last year. I was having some website issues and my shopping cart and stuff like that, so I really didn't publicize and push my website like I did. I had a few wholesalers out there, you know, other barbecue supply stores that sold my products, and I just kind of laid low. And we finally got our website redone and, and reworked with a web guy that I really love. He has turned out to be phenomenal. I went to a Shopify shopping cart and linked everything to QuickBooks and uh, everything like that, and it just makes 
business sense so much easier from a business standpoint. It's really helped us grow our business and steady growing every day. And those products like that, I can go in now and see who's looking at what and what they put in their shopping cart and what they abandoned. And, you know, it's just all kind of stuff like that that I wasn't used to having. And I think that kind of information kind of has helped me to know which direction I needed to go from week to week on sales, if that makes sense. I keep a pretty good stock of stuff up. And actually right now the butter bath has been such a hot seller. I am running low on it at the moment, but I'll have another order in by Friday. I can only imagine, Heath, that with the success that you have been seeing with the product, and I know there's teams that have used it recently, as in the last couple of weeks, that have won the overall grand championship at their specific competitions. Is there been a clamor for bigger sizes of butter bath and wrap than what you're currently selling, or are there options currently that are you know different in size? You don't know. No, nobody's actually asked for any more. Most of the competition teams out there are going to do three to four slabs of ribs. And that's why I kind of went with the 12 ounces and the four cups to do it that way. And then if somebody was going to do pork too, they would kind of use two bags of it. And so I hadn't had anybody ask for bigger packaging and anything like that, which of course, if somebody wants to buy it by the case and not by the pack, I would cut them a little bit better of a deal if they contacted me personally instead of going through, you know, just ordering by the bag off the website. And it may be later on where I create a button on there to where you can buy six bags of it for a discounted price. I'm working on adding some more stuff to that now, and I'm actually going to have a few more products coming out before long also. Heath, if people are interested, what's the best way to take a look at your products and potentially buy? Uh, VictoryLaneBarbecue.com is our website. And, of course, we have a list of dealers out there and wholesalers all across the country, uh, you know, like Atlanta Barbecue Supply, Memphis Barbecue Supply, Whiskey Bent, the Barbecue Superstore, Killer Hogs carries it, St. Louis Barbecue Supply, Barbecue Island, uh, the Outdoor Chef just picked us up. I don't have a list in front of me. It's just uh, Brills of Mississippi. There's a lot of barbecue supply stores just picked it up, and, and it's growing every day. I picked up a couple of new ones yesterday, but the orders is going out today, and we really anticipate for sales to quadruple this year is what I really anticipate on. Heath, continued success, and I really appreciate you being in the spotlight. I appreciate it very much. Thank you for having me on. Thanks again to Heath Riles for spending time with me. If you're interested in Heath's products, you can visit his website, VictoryLaneBBQ.com. That's VictoryLaneBBQ.com to peruse his products portfolio or, of course, to order some and try out for yourself. That's going to do it for this episode of the Barbecue Roundup. For updates about the show or what's going on with me, you can hit me up on the social medias, Facebook.com slash Greg.Rempe. You can get me on the Twitter at BBQ Central Show. Same handle for Instagram at BBQ Central Show. Or you can add me at Snapchat, Greg Rempe, one word, G-R-E-G-R-E-M-P-E. Don't forget to tune into the live BBQ Central Show each Tuesday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at thebbqcentralshow.com. Or you can watch the video feed at outdoorcookingchannel.com. And just in case you're wondering about that catchy tune that you hear in the transitions, that was written and played by none other than barbecue historian Joe Haynes of OC Barbecue. He has graciously allowed me to use this music for the show. And if you've never heard the full version, then treat yourself right now. I've included it on the back end of the show. Until next Thursday at noon, this is your program host and proud U.S. American Greg Rempe. Thanks for listening. He kicks the tires, and he lights the fires. He's queuing all night, but he never grows tired. Slow smoke meat, that's his only goal. As he puts a pig in the pit, and he smokes it whole. He's a pit master. Well, he keeps the fire down on the smoke. He's stoking those coals. Till the smoke can blow. The weather doesn't matter, be it sun or snow. Cause they ain't nothing gonna stop this backyard barbecue pro. He's a bit messed up.
grill The smoke and the meat As it roasts real slow To become a tree He cooks with tender care And he cooks with tender love And all the neighbors think Good Lord above Cause he's a pit master Yes, all the neighbors think 